All right. So we're going to talk about PCT, and we're going to go really in depth as to everything we can about PCT, what drugs to use, how they work, etc. And to some degree, the potential future of PCT. Now, first thing we need to do is understand how hormones are produced in the body. And in males, are produced by the HPTA, and in females, are produced by the HP. Oh, A. Yes, always get that wrong. So it's the hypothalamus pituitary testicular axis in a male, and it's the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis in a female. Now, the hypothalamus and the pituitary are in the brain. And the pituitary looks like a pair of bollocks, basically. It's sort of in the center beneath. So the hypothalamus produces GnRH. That then stimulates the pituitary to produce FSH and LH. FSH is follic follicle-stimulating hormone, and LH is luteinizing hormone. Now, <coughs> they then go down to the testes or the ovaries. And in the case of the man, FSH is responsible for stimulation of the Sertoli cells, which in turn produce sperm uh, and LH is responsible for stimulation of Leydig cells which in turn produces testosterone. In a female FSH stimulates egg maturation which is why when a female is on cycle as in gear cycle their monthly cycle stops because there's no egg maturation going on. Now um, that is effectively it. Now females also produce testosterone in the adrenal glands and 50% of the testosterone that females produce is actually the conversion of estrogen with, and other hormones within selective tissues. So only a quarter of their actual testosterone is produced by the ovaries. With me so far, right. Now, we have also localized regulatory controls. Now, the hypothalamus has estrogen receptors and it has androgen receptors and it is uh, by these mechanisms that it senses the levels of hormones within the body and as a result when we elevate those hormone levels through using steroids the hypothalamus senses this and reduces the production of GnHRH uh, in some cases completely stops it that obviously has a knock-on effect down the line the pituitary produces less FSH and LH and therefore the testes or the ovaries produce less sperm eggs and less hormone. Excuse me. But another thing happens at the same time. The testes produce inhibins. Now, these have two effects. They send a signal up to the pituitary, telling the pituitary to stop production, but they also work within the testes, telling the testes to stop production. Now, they have an opposing factor, which is an activin. So when you hear people talk about negative feedback, that's the inhibins. It's the inhibins that create the negative feedback loop, and it's those that tell everything to shut back down again. So the other issue is that when we go on cycle, that uh, our testes atrophy, they shrink. Now this is because, because the Leydig cells and the Sertoli cells are no longer being activated by the relevant triggers, they not only reduce in size, but they reduce in number. And the same happens within the ovaries. There's some level of ovarian shrinkage as well. In fact, one of the issues of the HCG diet that was very popular for a while was actually ovarian enlargement because the ovary was getting overstimulated by LH. Um, and as a result, it was getting bigger. So we have shutdown via androgen signals at the hypothalamus. We have shut down by inhibiting signals at the testes, ovarian, and the pituitary. And we have a shrinkage of the factory that produces the hormone. So when we come off, generally speaking, damage doesn't really occur at the hypothalamus. And in most cases, the hypothalamus will start to signal the production of GnRH quite rapidly. But then we hit a roadblock because we hit the maturity and the hit inhibin is there saying, ah, don't make any more. When we get past that, we hit the testes or the ovaries and the cells that manufacture the various factors are low in number and small in size. So even when they start working, they can't produce enough to support the 
body. So the most, the first drug that usually involves in a PCT is HCG, human chronic drug atropin. Now HCG mimics LH. This stimulates the Leydig cells, uh, both to return in size and increase in number. And as a result, hormone production volume increases. Now it's not super, super strong. So it doesn't have a massively huge impact, but it does help. Uh, and that is very much a bottleneck within recovery. It is basically testicular size and the ability for it to produce enough hormone. Now, one of the reasons why HCG is suggested throughout cycle is a very low dose it is because it mimics the natural levels of HCG and therefore stops this cellular degradation happening in the first place. Um, and it's actually a very good idea. Most of the fertility issues and the need for long-term studies to go on TRT is due to testicular damage. It doesn't generally happen with the pituitary of the hypothalamus. Generally, they're quite robust and generally they're fine. And 90% of the time, it is the testes that are damaged and it's the Leydig cells that are damaged and they just can't produce enough hormone permanently and eventually a user requires TRT. And one of the reasons why I'm such a big fan of PCT, but I'm also such a big fan of testing, is that if you test prior to ever using steroids and you establish a baseline for your hormones, then post PCT, you can always test to see if you fully recovered. When you go by feel, there's such a broad range. Uh, I think value is roughly about eight to 32 N1. Uh, which is a blood value of hormone. Um, now, 30 and 20, you, you're unlikely to feel any different. So you'll feel recovered. Chances are you'll feel recovered as low as 12, <coughs> as long as three tests is decent. And so um, you can be slowly damaging the testes and after every cycle, recovering just that little bit less. So say your standard start, your levels are 30. First cycle, you recover, but you're going to recover 28, 27. Next cycle, 25. Next cycle, 22. Next cycle, 20. Next cycle, 18. Next cycle, 15. All the time, you feel recovered, and you've not realized that you've not recovered fully. And then you hit that cycle where you return at 11. And now you feel like shit. But it's too late. The damage is done. Why, if you tested, you could see, right, I've not fully recovered. So I have one or two choices. I can stay off a bit longer and see if I do fully recover. Or I can run another PCT. Uh, so at least you have that option and that choice. And at least you're aware of the damage that's occurring. And you can make an informed decision about whether going on cycle again at that point is sensible for you. You might not give a shit and just think, fuck it, I'm happy with TRT. That's your choice. But at least you were given the choice. The way we currently all do it, which is go by feel, we remove that choice because we remove the information that we need to govern whether we are slowly declining our natural function. Anyway, so moving on. So we put HCG in. Now, HCG mimics LH. It has very, very little stimulus on Sertoli cells and has very little impact with FSH. But HMG, which is human menopausal gonotropin, has a ratio of basically 50 50 so it is equally good at stimulating or mimicking lh as it is as mimicking fsh now i've noticed recently in a few people that have come to me or more than a few people that have come to me with post cycle issues that their lh production is around normal sitting four five but their FSH production is low. And this is beginning to make me think that HMG is actually a good idea and that it should be included in a PCT and that it is important to restore FSH as well as LH. 
Now, I can't see anything supporting at the moment, and I've only just begun looking, about FSH having any relationship with, with testosterone production. But, I, like I say, I am seeing LH levels normal, FH levels low, testosterone levels low end but okay, but free testosterone very low. Sometimes it's due to ele elevated SHBG and sometimes it's not. But in all these cases, FSH is low. Now, this might just be a coincidence. It might have no relevance whatsoever. And from what I can see, there is no link at the moment. But it's just worth noteworthy that, that maybe it's worthwhile to bring FSH up as well. So therefore, it's worthwhile to include HMG. And maybe HMG is the better choice. Um, I've yet to discover exactly proportionally how more effective HMG is over HCG on stimulating the LH, but it would appear that both are fairly equal. So if that's the case, then HMG would be the better choice when it's 75 IU three times a week. Now, regarding going back to testicular damage, um, sorry, I lost track there a little bit. One of the things is if you maintain a level of HCG within the body throughout cycle, you're not going to maintain testicular function because we've got these inhibins shutting down at the testes and shutting down at um, the pituitary. But what you are going to do is maintain testicular mass, maintain Leydig cell activity, and therefore minimize Leydig cell damage. But it has to be a sensible dose. 250 IU twice a week is more than ample. 125, three times a week are the sort of doses you're looking at. Long term, if you start going higher, you can overstimulate the Leydig cells. And it can be equally as bad because they become desensitized. Now, it, it is not a permanent situation. But what you don't want to be doing is coming off cycle and having desensitized Leydig cells because you're not going to get your test back up and running properly. So it's important that this, this maintenance dose that you run throughout cycle is low. And it may even be viable to start looking at potentially running HMG throughout cycle as well. Surely it's got to be healthy to maintain both axes and not just one. Anyway, so we move on. So that's the reason for HCG use, to restore testicular mass and to restore Leydig cell function. Now, the next thing we generally use is Clomid and Novadex. Now, both of these are CIRM, selective estrogen receptor modulators, and it means that they act like estrogen at some receptors, and they block and have a non-estrogen action at other receptors. And one of the receptors that they have a blocking non-estrogen action is the hypothalamus. So as a result, the hypothalamus thinks levels are low, and starts pumping out more GnRH. Now, we know levels are already low. We know at this point that our natural levels are low, but at this point, we still have elevated levels of unnatural testosterone or hormone in our systems. So the signals to stay shut down is still there. By putting in Clomid, we start the process of getting these signaling hormones up and running again. So basically what happens as our artificial test starts dropping, our signal for natural production comes up. The idea being that when this drops below threshold, natural production takes over, and therefore we don't have a period in the middle of no production. If we waited until natural artificial levels dropped off completely, then we would start to see the GnRH signaling start, and then we'd start to see LH and FSH production start, but we still have this bottleneck of reduced tissue function because of size and number of Leydig cells at the bottom. So what we do is we increase the Leydig cell count first. We then start the signaling before the artificial levels have dropped so that we get a crossover and therefore we get a smooth transition from artificial hormone into natural hormone. <laughs> now, 
I've seen people mention uh, raloxifene. It, it's also another brand of another, well, another brand of serum. It has very little impact on the uh, testes. And in fact, I don't know if I'll be able to find it. I'll see if I can find the study while I'm talking to you. Um, I'm going to dig out a study and show you. Excuse me a minute. Show you. No, I don't want that. What have I done? Uh, and show you. Uh, show you some of the. Uh, um, figures returned. So what? What, what I have seen, here we go, right, what I have seen, this is the part, right, okay, so this was a study using tamoxifen, turimifen, and raloxifen, okay, uh, and to see their effects on testosterone levels. Now, their action is by blocking signaling at the hypothalamus, increasing GnRH, and therefore increasing FSH and LH production. And what was discovered was that it was 20 milligrams of tamoxifen and it was 60 milligrams of tor and 60 milligrams of rough. Rifloxifen did very little. Uh, it wasn't very good. Um, and as a result, improvements were minimal and the improvements dropped off quite rapidly. Um, Torifen did show an increase in FSH and LH production. Uh, between 50 and 75 percent um, and therefore an increase in total test but what was seen again after about a month TOR started to decline in its efficiency whereas tamoxifen continued to elevate up to the three month point uh, and that was just 20 milligrams so it would appear that 20 milligrams of, tum uh, of um, tamoxifen is incredibly effective and by far the best choice for PCT uh, it would also appear that more than 20 milligram is a waste and the higher dose did not result in any better effect there's also now the next choice of drug is clomid um, same action, uh, used very heavily for fertility, but what we are also seeing here is that Novadex is actually more effective than Clomid. So if you had to choose one out of the two, you'd go Novadex without a doubt. Um, and and it, it's been shown that Novadex is um, a lot more, more effective than, in fact, the equivalent dose of Clomid and Novadex is 150 milligrams. So really what we're seeing is that generally in PCT, we use too fucking much uh, and that 50 milligram of Clomid and 20 milligram of Novadex is plenty. Uh, and there may even be cause to, to not even bother with Clomid at all, but I personally wouldn't really want to overly take that risk. Um, they also, this is where they become very useful as well, they block the signal of inhibins at the pituitary gland, which helps. And Novadex has been shown to have a direct impact on testicular function in the testes themselves. And it can boost the, it can boost testosterone production directly at the testes by having an action on the Leydig cells, and by having an action in reducing inhibiting activity. So, uh, Novadex is definitely the drug of choice. Now, I've mentioned. Um, Inhibins. Now, what I haven't mentioned is activins. Now, it would appear that these have been synthesized and they are available in a peptide form. Now, in theory, from what I've done research wise, 
uh, they should cancel out inhibins and they increase sensitivity and they increase hormone production. So moving forward in PCT, I can see these playing a role in a peptide form. Uh, I can also see these playing a role in support throughout cycle. Um, at the end of the day, the ideal situation is that we prevent total shutdown in the first place. Now, though we may not be able to elevate natural production during cycle, to some degree we should be able to keep it under control. Uh, so, uh, it would appear that, that we may, moving forward, be able to do something in blocking inhibitors, which would be great. Um, and would definitely reduce the level of shutdown. Um, because effectively we could take HMG throughout cycle uh, and we could take an active in and therefore we wouldn't have shutdown. It just wouldn't happen. Um, so definitely something in that. Now, females. Uh, I spoke about females quite a bit in, recently and I want to speak a little bit more. Females do suffer from shutdown a lot because they run a hormone birth control. They don't really have an impact because when they stop with their cycle, steroid cycle, they're still taking their birth control and that is still pumping estrogen and progesterone into their system. And so <clears throat> they don't feel any lull in hormones or anything else. And the only thing they'll probably suffer from is a little bit of androgen deficiency, uh, which can easily be cured with 50 milligrams of DHEA a day. Um, in fact, about 43% of all women suffer from an, um, a, a low level of testosterone and should supplement with DHEA. Uh, but beyond that, they don't really get any post-cycle down because they're effectively not off-cycle because they're still using birth control. But those that don't, um, they can have some pretty severe shutdowns. Now, what I've been playing around with is various aspects. And at the moment, it would appear that Clomid, taken between day two and day seven of their natural cycle, is really, really effective at restoring their natural hormone balance. Um, it would appear that it does improve mood uh, and sleep. It does increase appetite. It does make them quite fertile. Uh, and it seems to raise their body temperature. But everything seems to settle down about four or five days after taking the five-day course. Uh, and then everything seems to be pretty much back to normal. It's not a case of that every female is going to need this, but it is as a female you start to find that you do suffer low mood post-cycle and it is taking two, three months for your natural cycle to go back to normal. I would recommend 50 milligrams of Clomid every day from day two to day seven, but that means you have to track your cycle. If you don't, then you're just going to have to run the five-day cycle uh, and pick it up then when you do get some return of cycle. Um, that's that, and I think, oh yeah, that was the other thing, um, been looking into, another thing that's very, very useful at this point is to take natural, um, basically receptor blockers. Uh, and the two that seem to stand out are 3-O hat, also known as 3-O who, which is full name is 3-17-dioxo etichol, 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 dash one four six trium. Um, that's one of them, and the other one is one four six. Androstratine 317-dione, uh, also known as ATD. Uh, and these two are very strong aromatized inhibitors. Um, and they seem to have a brilliant effect at the hypothalamus and massively boost GnRH. In fact, 
as a non-steroid user, studies have shown increases between 50 and 800% in testosterone levels. But granted, those dramatic increases were on people that already had low testosterone levels. Uh, what uh, has been found in those that have normal is that there's a, a 50 to 100% increase, which is still pretty decent. But more notable is a decrease in estrogen, which is always handy. So um, it would potentially be worth looking at also at this point running some form of natural booster. And if so, these would be the drugs of choice. Um, and you might as well hit it from every angle. Um, and that's it, really, PCT-wise. Um, they're not guaranteed to work. Uh, that's the unfortunate thing. Um, it is important that if you don't feel normal afterwards that you do test. But you need to leave it about three weeks post-PCT before you test so that the drugs don't have any impact on the test. Uh, and see where you go from there and react accordingly. Um, regards PCT, it's a personal choice. Um, only thing I'm going to say is a lot of people don't recognize that infertility or, or permanent shutdown of your testicular axis, they don't see that as, as a health indication. They don't see that as, as damage, but it is. We may not view it very much as so because we just go on TRT, but to anyone outside of our community, that is damage, that is harm, that is a side effect, permanent long-term damage you've done to your body. And it's a personal choice. Um, lots of people will tell you that TRT is great, TRT is fine, it's, it's healthy, it's been proven time and time again. The bottom line is, TRT from the studies are done on medical TRT, which is obviously a prescription drug, and it's doctor prescribed and it's doctor controlled and managed. And it's also around 250 milligrams every 10 to 14 days, possibly even 21. So a lot lower than what most of we use. Uh, but it's not a UGL. So that's the first point you need to make very understanding about this is that UGLs are not clean. Now they don't contain loads of nasty bugs that are going to cause us problems post injection. But long term, potentially, there could be problems. Uh, but even in TRT studies, there is some conflict. Okay, the medical world is still in conflict about is it safe, is it isn't safe, etc., etc., etc. And so it's not the easiest one to to really say, yeah, it's fine. There is conflict there. There is difference of opinion. And we don't really know. There is some evidence of higher cardiovascular episode with long-term TRT patients, but then that study is being, being claimed as being not quite good enough. But there are other studies as well. But then there are studies that say it's perfectly fine. The studies that show an improvement in health, which everybody quotes and goes, well, look, this TRT study says it's healthy and it improves the health. Yes, it did, in comparison to having low tests not in comparison to having normal levels. So those health benefits are based on the improvement from having low test. They're not based on improvements on normal baseline test levels. But ultimately, it's your personal choice. I would say, if you can, PCT. But if you're going to PCT, you need time off. Minimum six to eight weeks, ideally longer. If you're not going to do that, then you're probably going to do more damage than good because your Leydig cells are going to be quite sensitive post-PCT and shutting them back down is more likely to do more damage. So then your option is a cruise. Now, but if you're going to cruise, at least cruise correctly. 250 a fortnight is, is more in line with what you should be doing. And I would recommend that if you're going to cruise that you have some instability in your injections. Uh, the point being that if blood plasma levels are too stable, your body will start upregulating clearance of that. It will go to terminal half-life and you'll start shifting hormone out faster. And therefore, your blood plasma levels will reduce. So if you're going to TRT, go for a fortnightly injection over a weekly injection. And that instability and that peak and that trough and that slightly elevation and drop in hormone levels 
is actually going to help keep it stopping your body from upregulating the clearance and therefore effectively lowering the levels in your body. Okay, so that's it. We've hit half an hour and I need to answer that phone call. I hope you found it worthwhile and I'll speak to you soon.